Good evening. Welcome to the Guest Writer Series. My name is Alan Borst, and I'm the administrator of the Guest Writer Series here at the University of Utah. This evening, we're thrilled to be joined by Diane Williams. Uh, for our program, we'll begin with an introduction by Lindsay Webb. After Diane's reading, Michael Mejia will moderate our conversation with Diane and others before turning our attention to questions submitted by those of you attending tonight. Please note that the Q&A button, not to be confused with the chat, has been enabled at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to share any questions for Diane there throughout the program. Also know this event is being recorded and will be made available on the U of U English YouTube channel. We encourage you to purchase Diane's books by the, uh, at your local bookstore. A link to the King's English Bookstore here in Salt Lake City will be posted in the chat momentarily. The Guest Writer series was made possible through the University of Utah English Department and received funding from Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks Program and Utah Humanities. Utah Humanities empowers groups and individuals to improve their communities through active engagement in the humanities. The series is also supported in part by Utah Arts and Museums with funding from the state of Utah and the National Endowment for the Arts. Now let me introduce Amy Seiler. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, and Goshute and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and federal government, and we affirm the Uni University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. And now I'd like to invite Lindsay Webb to turn on her camera and mic to introduce Diane Williams. Thanks, Amy. Um, and thanks for everyone for being here. It seems customary to begin with the fact that Diane Williams stories are short, tiny, really. However, this sometimes gives the mistaken impression that there's something like eggs, self-contained world systems, inert and quiet. But if you've read her stories, you know they're not so enclosed. Her stories are not eggs. They're also not exactly lightning bolts, peepholes, or blizzards. These are all terms I've used to try to describe her stories to friends unsuccessfully. I would even say they're not minimalist, despite their compression. Instead, her stories are attuned to their own words as substances, volatile and active, which with often concussive force, generate light, heat, and those unusual items known as story and character. Some fictions try to be portraits or containers of the world. Williams functions more like channels of it. In her work, characters feel whole and strange. Relationships feel strained and ancient. Otherwise, innocuous conversations feel charged with what can't be articulated. Her stories make the world feel bigger than it is, bigger than its characters, and bigger than any attempt to contain it, which, of course, it is. It's a miracle anything can happen at all, her stories seem to say. I am a poet, so when I first encountered her stories, I decided they were poems, wrongly labeled. Like poems, her stories carry the intensity of private thoughts with the efficiency of a dirty joke. Like poems, her writing seems to be about the strange bits of language that make up our relation to ourselves and our world and what gets lost in the transfer. With more time, I've since come around to their status as fiction, as carriers of personality and event and perspective. But I admit that a line like, I admire my darling husband, I gave him my little paw, overwhelms me in the poetic sense. The first story in Diane Williams' newest collection ends with this line. So I scale the roof all the way to the ridge and I have never had to climb down. About that ending, Williams recently said in the New Yorker, that's the great dream. It's what inspires me to do my work, that if I keep at it, I won't have to come down. I worry that I've spent this entire introduction trying to pin down these stories and what they do. When what I'm really trying to get at is that it's probably much more pleasurable to simply absorb them in their strange alchemy here from our position below. 
Diane Williams is the founder and editor of the Distinguished Literary Annual Noon. She is the author of eight previous volumes of short fiction, and she lives in New York City. And it is my pleasure to welcome her tonight. I am really, really thrilled to be here tonight. And I apologize if I look a bit spooky. Um, we had some hijinks with lighting and malfunctioning Zoom um, mechanical uh, parts. So um, I want to thank everybody. I hope I'm, I'm a little um, um, undone and a little bit in disarray here, hoping I'm getting it right, that I'm speaking when I'm supposed to speak. Um, it's very dark here, it's very late. I think it's not as dark and not as late where you are. Um, so um, I've just gotten a message. Yes, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So here I will begin. I'm going to read um, first a brand new story entitled Gladly. I do wanna thank before I begin Alan Borst and the University of Utah, which I've been trying to get to for three years. <laughs> so I'm very excited to be here. Let me say that. Gladly. He is a figure I once engaged with for years amid scenes with nearly religious significance attached to them. And by chance this Saturday, I had witnessed him stepping away from a park path and stooping beneath the leaf cover only to put his hand against the tree trunk. He smiled when he saw me, but when I reached him, he was speechless and sour. And then he proceeded on his way headlong. If only he had said, you come with me. I fell back, stood at a distance, but let us leave a famous man for a moment. Two objects that had been abandoned, surely through some fault of their own, showed up on the border grass. And detritus is common around here, but these two items were an arousing color and brand new enough to engage my interest. The clean canvas, all star high tops, were perhaps my size. And then as if this footwear could somehow stay the same while it changed, the shoes showed up as ruined goods. One of the pair had a long rip at the heel. Well, where I was is where I often go for the sights, for a walk at day's end for deep breaths or just to listen to the faint clicking or how my own feet smack at the path. A boy of five or six was picking up handfuls of nuts that I thought were meant for the squirrels. He was inspecting the ground and most efficiently scavenging, stuffing his pockets and repeatedly patting his large jammed pockets. He'll be known in later life for his gluttony or for his enterprise. What am I, I wonder, dear God, now best known for? The next story is from my new book, How High That High. And it's the story that Lindsay referred to, the first one up. Upper loop. I'm trying to think if there's any reason for having fun anymore on any level. I know that's not the kind of thing people usually talk about, God forbid. So I scale the roof all the way to the ridge and I have never had to climb down. The next story is Stick.
sorry, it's get a bit, here I am, stick. How best to touch these woody objects or a person? She batted together the parts of the sycamore stick she had broken in two and then made of them the self-important capital letter T and she spun one. She rolled the stick over her thumb and then she tried for greater twirling speed as she sat on the park bench that bore a personalized inscribed plaque dedicated to my dearest Nancy. She is not that Nancy, nor is she the beloved Lara yet, who might have a plan that aims to shore up her heart and her strength with tools and accessories that support her life in the early evening burning summertime in the city. Just do it, she thought and she put the stick through its paces again. Its athleticism, its success, it seemed to her, could foretell her own, so that it pained her when she had to throw the sticks away. She stood suddenly to walk on, but instead paused to watch girls at their hopscotch game. Hop, 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 jump and bow. They bowed down when they stooped to retrieve their pebble marker. To revive her sense of purpose, the woman was out on the avenue hugging her little body. Her feet felt pinched inside her shoes, her best shoes. Her stylized hair fell down her shoulders. What else? She put one foot precisely in front of the other, just like the old adage prescribed, just to test what that would feel like. Would this help her to suppose that she was any more determined, any more capable of taking care of herself? She prayed nobody was paying her any mind. As this gambit caused her hips to sidle this way, that way, lewdly. In her own home, she had no witness. At bedtime these days, she entered the room alone in which she and the doer, Don Super, had once slept together. He had so often recoiled from her. Well, oughtn't she be able to reach out to a trusted person with the same confidence she has when she takes up a bar of soap or nudges a chair back? From a distance, she used to watch Super's penis rise because he had made it clear that he had no need for her participation. And although his appendage essentially floated in place, it also looked ready and able to propel itself. What this woman decided on Fifth Avenue in the here and now is that she ought to plow forward and skip. She should not permit her arms and hands to drag down like wet noodles. Here's another called Harriet Mounts. I was able to get Harriet Mounts to shriek. And I think I must have thought any shriek would do. When she first stood there naked, I remember she was solemn or she looked annoyed or was she really pained? But she did seem to like me, the cues. She had really focused her eyes on me and she had smiled while on her haunches by the hearth a bit earlier. Because she is a brunette, the sight of the crop of red hair above her pubis surprised me very much. So how do I put this? Her raptures aside, she lost interest in me quickly. Although she sent me notes and letters, she said she knew that the tragedy of losing her would be a shock for me, that I'm always in her mind in a nice way. That is my personal sorrow is present for her. I should please accept her deepest sympathy, 
that she cannot help sending me her understanding sympathy. Oh, there was just so much pleasure in store when I was a boy and I was resourceful. Once a year, my brother and I sneaked into a fair where they handed out free samples of our favorite sweets. And we were gifted with these strips of aluminum from a toothpaste company. If you ran your thumbnail across the strip, you could hear a voice singing, use that amicum. The woman sang the words quickly, or I could get her to croak this out slowly over and over. And now for some respite from all of that, sight see. Point blank up ahead was the Atlantic Ocean. But at this time it was lackluster from where we stood, still too big and navy, but not glossy. I won't swim, I said. My friend said, what did you say? He was bound then to shout louder. A mother leaned down to ask her little boy, what does a cow say, Zachariah? Moo? I don't feel well, I said but I was quieted by my friend. What was that bird? There was something melodic coming out of it. I wished we could have been swept right along because heaped up human activities close by were packed too thickly in a small greasy place. Were we simply roaming forward toward a Northern region distant from our own? I actually liked the ride to the other end of town. Although on the bus, I was nauseated. We had lunch in a cafe with small paned windows. The decoration inside I thought was intended to inspire fervor for food plus awe. Where did I end up? Not yet anywhere, mere intellect. And now, because I always find this a bit daunting, I need to read something that will give me more gusto. And that is from my collected works, um, a story called To Die. I hope it will always have this particular magic for me. I don't know how it will affect you. To die. I undressed myself. I wanted sex. I wanted sex. I wanted sex. I wanted sex. I climbed into bed. She wanted sex with me. She always wants sex with me. When I discharged myself this time into her, I was feeling myself banging as high up into her as I have ever gotten myself up into her. I had just done the same with another woman who was always wants sex with me too. There is another woman that I do the same with. There is another woman. There is another woman. There are five women who always want sex with me. They are always ready. It does not matter when or what or where, but they are ready. I have a great deal of money, which I have earned. I have physical beauty for a man. I have intelligence. I have work to do, which I love to do. But women are what I prefer to anything, to lie down with them, the turning to touch the woman and knowing I will be received for sex as soon as I wish to be welcome. I have been at it like this, this way for years and it does not matter when I will die. I have had everything I have ever wanted. I should die now. There should be a killing at my house. There should be so much, so much more for me, which I am not 
able to conceive of up oh, i just got a reading that my connection's unstable i hope it isn't um now i'm reading it's so effortful Klaus's whole hand face down slid under my bottom during the taxi cab ride. Shall I come over tonight, he asked me. That man has such an extraordinary ability to get close to ordinary life. I've tried. He was in a chair at my kitchen table and I climbed in behind him onto the chair, my arms around his front not for long. He told me in the bedroom to lie down on the floor on my back and he got on top and he hooked his feet around my ankles. That didn't last. So when I wait for the right moment, then I hop on top of Klaus. My legs are spread and bent like a frog's. If only I could climb Klaus like a tree. I've seen movies of young boys climbing palm trees. They embrace the trunk and then they march right up. Or is it that they shimmy? That's just about it. They lean in instead of dangling. Can you imagine all the juice the palm tree has to transport all the way to its palm fronds way up there so that the tree is pulling liquid from the earth in a major way? and the shaft itself is so spindly. And yet my entire nature and all my instincts fail to clasp close for even one quiver before I have to come right back down from there. This one is Prayer of the Primogenitor. Once I was there, I wanted out of there. Although they served us plum tort and coffee and it was delicious with whipped cream and that helped. We were talking about what was going to happen. It was really very emotional while we were eating our sweets and drinking coffee from cups that had been filled from the spigoted urn. At the palace of the town hall, we still had the electrified Polish chandelier that was fully lit, even though fires, earthquakes, and military attacks have changed this building's appearance. And a lady was gliding from guest to guest with her hands locked to imply she might be at prayer. Her mouth was open, the tongue was curling up toward her upper row of teeth, and the nose was upturned as well, her eyes her eyes were blue, white, black, and orange, and she was ably balancing the lyrical and the dramatic. She was advancing toward me and I thought, good God, when a dog with white silver tipped hair threw himself hard at her, she called the dog Electra and gestured it away. As she reached my side, she said, now who is this? Where did you come from? I took her hand, surprised myself, bowed slightly and kissed it. Bless you, she said. And so blessed I was, I was wishing that soon I would have the art of making people listen. I'd be talking my way to success. I'd be thinking like a millionaire and know all that I need to know about married life and intimate sex. I am supposed to hope for things to be right and comfortable in the future. And not long after this, I encountered a big stone when I started a garden. I did it all by myself, getting that stone to loosen up, using a long steel spit about five feet long. 
I found a point of leverage, established that big stone in the soil near the road and put a few smaller stones on top. And when I pass by my cairn, I think about this, that I am a man ready to receive what I deserve and that I am a man who has this swell erection. And one more story. This one is Grief in Moderation. A necessary and great object of interest, he had first found Valentina standing among other members of her family. Her clothes were a shocking pink color, and as her wet hair dried, it began beguilingly to curl. And she was fragrant and Tom thought she was showy. She's not common in the wild. And lots of other people still go up to her and consider her the way Tom does. Most persistently, she brings into view a face that displays full-bodied welcome. One weekday evening in a local restaurant, a very tall, drunk man walked over to the pair, kissed Valentina on the mouth, and then departed quickly. Tom had questions. It was a puzzling capper to a typical day. Tom on that day at work had closed out tax cases upon which no tax was due and awaited a repairman to discuss the photocopier failure. And Valentina has responsibility for all of the patients on her hospital shift, as well as the building and people are responsive to her, sometimes fervently. She did not respond, however, to Tom's questions. She kept at her meat. She might otherwise have been caught in contradictions, but then she backed up in her chair and she gave her husband her answers. But it isn't true. I, I don't recall, sort of, yes, sometimes I, I do. At bedtime, Valentina lay on her back, arms at her sides, as did Tom. There was no intertwining, no tender touch that needed to become better still, except that their small patterned wallpaper seemed to be excited the next morning. The tiny daisies were scored by the shadows of the slats of the Venetian blinds and the stripes were shivering. And here at dawn was Valentina's instrumental smile, her sign of sweetness that is the flying start, the fresh impetus, the feature on her face that creates her particular style. And in theory, she well understands any person's right to have privacy, to challenge and to complain without fear of reprisal, to make known his or her wishes, to receive complete information, to be wrenched. That's the conclusion of my reading. So I wait further instructions. Thank you so much, Diane. It's uh, really fantastic, uh, as um, has been said, to have you here finally. And I'm glad that you're glad to, to join us. I've been um, such a huge fan of your work ever since um, I first encountered it in Romancer Erector, which is still among my favorite uh, uh, books. I, I love the, 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 you know, the work since and, and the works before as well, which I've sought out. Um, but that was my, um, my introduction. And I was um as Lindsay said you know just sort of like um obsessed with trying to just sort of talk to people about like you have to read this book you know that the the, the, the uniqueness of the voice um and the uniqueness of your approach to narrative um you know just remains so identifiable to me and um and 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 hard to define again as, as Lindsay said and I, I'm just sort of thinking about actually a, a comment um 
that Annie DeWitt had in a, a review or a, a, an interview that she did with you uh, with the LA Review of Books before Fine, 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 Fine. She wrote about your editing for noon that every comma and break is deliberated over with a careful sense that the page itself is a stage which must be must jointly surprise and inflame. And I thought uh, that that was um, really actually a great description of my sense of your your work, my, my experience of, of your work. And so I think maybe one of the things that I'm most curious about um, is is your process of producing these these pieces? Like, you know, um, what might be, for example, a typical beginning or opening gesture, and what materials sort of pass through your hands, um, you know, language or or images or whatever, um, as you develop and finish the work. Um, you know, what are you thinking about when you are considering a particular sentence? Mm. That's a lot to respond to. <laughs> before I before I do that, I I do want to tell Lindsay how grateful I am for her introduction. It was quite wonderful. Um, um, to answer your question, what do I have in mind when I sit down? Um, that's that is why I'm always saying this is why I do it. This is why I do this work. This, but this this is one of the more important reasons I do the work is there is nothing on my mind. And so that's a dreadful circumstance to, to be, to be, to feel empty or to feel unanchored or to feel, um, well, unanchored and empty is enough. So the process has to begin in that state of, unanchored and empty because there is no other state. So my, the only avenue open to me is to put words on paper and then work furiously to make something out of it. So there is no opening gesture or there may be an opening gesture that is never, never will see the light of day. So it's a dis very disorderly process. Um, it's very rare that I would sit down and try to tell a story and the times that I have done that haven't, haven't amounted to much. They're boring. They're, they're boring accounts. So, um, so what's interesting to me really is what can accident produce or what, what happens when clashing language comes together that I would never have intended to put together. Um, and then, of course, there are the preoccupations. There are the refrains in one's mind that are tedious and haunting, and there are memories. So they'll be uh, those come come on come onto the page. But the composition is is um, the composition is slow. Um, taking the language and putting it together in ways that interest me. I, I, don't, I don't want, I, I, I want it all to be new to me. So, um, um, so it's exciting if I have books that I treasure at my elbow to pick up and I might get language. I might get a noun or a, or a prepositional phrase or a, a a funny, some sort of funny jargon uh, that mixes up with what my mother always said um, when she was angry with me. Um, and that's fun, just, just, and it's fun also to take a sentence that might have a very um, um, usual or predictable sequence um, and mix it up, um, just pluck several words from the end of it and throw them at the front. But that happens too be for acoustical reasons. I like more and more I'm interested in how to chain not only words and syllables, but sentences and paragraphs together acoustically. So that drives a lot of what happens on the page as well. And um, I'm always curious to see if 
if just like I've never composed music, but if I were composing music or the same, I, I look at the words in that way. Or, do I have a lot of eames going on, a lot of ings, a lot, is there, uh, how, the, the, the sound of it, uh, there might be repeats that surprise me. I might find out when I feel I've really ended the story that there's a relation between the sounds at the start and the sounds at the end. But um, it doesn't get easier. In fact, it gets much harder because I know that I've done that. Oh, you can't do that again. You can't do that again. And after writing 500 or 600 stories, it's very hard not to do it again. <laughs> to do everything again. So that's an answer to your question. That's an amazing answer. Um, and it just touches on so many things that interest me. Um, we have a lot of questions uh, coming in, so I won't um, take up too much time. But I, I just, um, yeah, I mean, I think um, in that same interview, you talk about uh, your, your the influence of the bricolure as a as a, um, a sort right. of figure for you, and that definitely I'm, I'm hearing that in what you're 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 describing here. You mentioned music and your uh, sort of not not composing uh, music yourself, but you know you've trained as a dancer, you've done some work in sculpture and and and, and drawing. You've said in college, mm -hmm. and I, I do wonder sort of like how sort of contact and practice in other arts affects your your approach to composition? Oh, I'm sure that it has. I'm sure that it has. Um, I might not be the one to be able to describe how that happened, but I, but I do love improvising. I don't like having a plan. I know that some great writers have, are very fastidious and, and plan, and I, I, I can't do that. Um, so, and I've been doing um, needlework, stitching, and and the fun of that is sloppiness and chaos. And I, I can make a mistake and then be opportunistic with what happened here. You know, a big blotch. I mean, I never would have thought of creating a big blotch. It's a blotch because I don't like the purple and then I put green over it and then I put orange over it and I, I never would have come up with that had I planned. The big mistake might turn out to be the, the centerpiece. So I, I enjoy the relation between that work and, and writing. Um, Excellent. I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay and Amy. They have questions as well. So I'll step aside. Okay. Yeah, um, I can go ahead and jump in. Um, and I, I think it segues nicely um, with this idea of bricolage. Um, so I was reading an interview in the White Review. And at one point you say that objects can save us. I might need a certain trinket, for instance, and it may, might save me for a day, a month. Objects obviously have a power. I'm struck by how the objects, but also the language in these stories have real material and aesthetic weight. And as somebody pointed out in the chat, we're getting to see you inside your very cool house. Um, so I was hoping <laughs> that- That's an can... accident. We didn't mean to <laughs> yeah. be in the room. Yeah, the benefit of Zoom life. Um, and I, I was just hoping you could talk a little bit more about objects um, and, um, you know, maybe how they provide inspiration or help you develop a story. Uh -huh. Well, I'm looking at your necklace as we're speaking. <laughs> Thinking, I really want that necklace. Um, yes. Um, I I've had in a kind of compulsive, obsessive relation to, to jewels of all sorts, um, glass, plastic, real. Um, I think I really did believe that there was a jewel of some, of some sort that that if I could only own it would save me. I think I I believed this on such a deep level that it's only. Um, 60 years later that I think I'm, I'm released from this curse. <laughs> but um, 
there's nothing I want now anymore. I don't even believe there's something I could find that could help me. Um, and it's very sad. But um, no, I do think that there were times where the trinket saved me. I had to have the trinket. I thought if I had the trinket, I would have the strength, the courage to do X, Y, Z. And I think, I think it really mattered. Um, and um, sadly, the trinkets were, were just so weak. They had so little power that, that the, um, the hit off of them lasted such a, such a short while. Um, but I mean, everything that we live with, um, I'm sure is making a, 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 a deep, a deep impression. I'm, I've actually been working on a story that um, has to do with building facades because as I work, I'm looking at the same, the same stuff every day. And, and um, it's a sort of brick and it's a color of brick that sucks the life out of me. It just sucks the life out of me. Then there, but then rolling down the avenue on the bus, you, you see these fabulous um, stonework carvings, these urns and these ribbons and these eagles and um, uh, gods and sphinxes. And you get to see them whiz by, but I mean, they, they do, they really do matter. Um, so I, I'm sure it has to do, I mean, we're always so selective about what we see in them, about what we remember. And um, likely we're seeing what we hope to see or um, typically see, which is too bad. But um, yes, objects are, are just as important as people, I hate to say it. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to say. That's what it's come to. I just have one uh, question. In an interview, you say part of what drew you to fiction was a collapse of your religious education um, and asking questions about God. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the relationship between God and fiction or God seeking and fiction. Mm. That's an interesting question. Let me think for a second if I know how, how to even begin to address that. Well, um, there is a God on the page if you're an omniscient narrator. That is so crazy. And um, when I take that up, I'm shocked at how excited I get. I have all this power, I can make anything happen. And um, so I must say, I really enjoy that. And the idea that I could boss the real God around if he, if he or she it exists is crazy and thrilling, which can all be done on the page. Um, and so you can speak in the voice of God which is outrageous. I don't know how, well, how or why so many writers have gotten away with it for so many, so uh, for millennium anyway. Um, it's, it's really crazy that you could presume to be in and out of people's minds and, and have be so wise. Um, so I think that is going on. Um, the pressure of, all this literature um, that we, whether we like it or not, we're all subject to is something that it's exciting to feel that you could just, I could just shake it off. I could just say, no, I could just say, well, here's, here's the way I, I would have done it. Or, you know, I, I, I'm taking over now. It's, it's, it is quite thrilling. Of course, if, if, if the text itself is a mess or poorly conceived, then nothing has been achieved. But if some magic occurs, then it, then it is very exciting. I'm gonna I'm jump back in here with um, just to sort of pull some questions from the Q and A that we've got. 
And I, I want to start with your comment about the, the God on the page as an omniscient narrator. And one of the things that I, um, that I love about the work is how, you know, so how, how few omniscient narrators there are. Like the, 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 that, that sort of concept is always being undercut, right? By um, the, 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 the narrator that seems omniscient in the first sentence or first paragraph is often revealed as like um, actually a, an observer participant in the story. Right. Um, right. So we have a question uh, from Meredith here that's talking about the that you know as she says that she, I've noticed that a lot of your work is based on a subject's self perception, and how that creates tension with how they are observed. And she's asking, how do you observe? What intrigues you? Where do you do most of your writing? Um, so I'll just toss that out. Oh, there. how do I observe and where do I do? I do most of my writing in the room I'm sitting in right now. And how do I observe? Um, how do I, I wish I knew, I wish I knew. I, I'm fascinated by the way other people observe. People who I share experiences with, who remember things that I don't remember and remember them for long periods and can recount them in, in um, exquisite detail. And I can't do that. So how do I observe? I'm usually disappointed in how I observe. It seems that I don't see that much. I think I'm, I'm closed off. Um, I, I don't remember what a room looked like, what the furnishings were, what somebody was wearing, what everybody said. I don't have a very good oral mem memory. I don't remember conversations. I wish I did. I know there are people who are great, great writers who, who are able to deliver immense amounts of dialogue. And I've queried some of them who I admire and they say, I just hear it. I just remember, I just hear my father. I just hear my mother. I'm so envious because well, I'm not capable of that. So I have to manufacture it. And that's why I, my, my stories are short. It's a lot of effort and, and, and not much to work with. That's great. I mean, so, I mean, I think um, this maybe sort of relates to our, our, this, the, the next question, which is from um, Ali Kessler. Um, relationships often feel, she says, at the center of your stories. Is there something about that particular tension that inspires you? Mm, absolutely. Um, everything about it inspires me um, and torments me. I think I think it's the frustrating relations that one that I can't uh, recover from that are ancient and current. Um, so I suppose I'm always fussing with that. Um, yes. Um, I've oh, I've long I long to in life be um, have enormous poise and wisdom in my relations. I'm sure we all do, but um, when we are shocked and surprised by the what we might view as the craziness of certain important people. Um, yes, it's very hard to recover. And, and the questions, the questions endure. All right, I have a, another question. This is from Rebecca Knight. Um, her question is, do you find your work to be mostly satire or is that simply dependent on the reader's perspective? Ah, uh, yeah, I'm hoping it's not and maybe too much of it is, and I'm not even sure what satire is, but, but I, I wish my work weren't, I hope it isn't satire. So if it is, then I've failed. Um, or, I mean, from my perspective, I've failed. Um, I don't wanna be writing satire. I think I know what it means. I'd have to look it up. <laughs> Uh, another uh, question comes in here from um, Ashton Politanov. Um, oh, yeah. He's asking, uh, uh, is 
the something is there something that you've recently read watched or listened to that has inspired you mm. yes ashton the work of years and noon that we recently published has inspired me um noon is a constant inspiration to me ashton is a fairly frequent contributor to noon um and we've just closed out noon uh, 2022, and um, so I've been very preoccupied with it. Um, so that's that's that question um, deserves a long and thoughtful answer that I don't think I'm capable of giving right now. I, you know, here's an, another version of that. I would say. Um, comes from uh, JJ Rogers, who's asking what books you keep by your side during those moments that you're of wanting to find language. Mm. Well, there are high, I don't, you probably can't see, I'm in the room, but there are stacks and stacks of these books and they tumble. And when they tumble, they get reordered so that what I see tomorrow will be slightly different than what I saw the day before, just because they the stack tumbled but there, it's a variety, um, it's everything. It's um, uh, books about Trump and books about the Cartier family, it's Grace Kelly, it's uh, Spinoza, it's um, uh, John Cheever, it's um, Isaac Singer, my, some of my favorite writers, um, it's, um, sexual life in ancient Egypt. It's it's um, it's an exciting. Actually, I think I have a great library. <laughs> All these years. That's fantastic. Um, all right, we've got maybe one more here, um, and I, I think you know again it, it sort of speaks to your comments earlier about. Um, you know, sort of patterns or recurrences that happen in the work, um, but somehow you manage to sort of, you know, uh, keep creating these constant variations. And uh, we have a question uh, again from JJ asking um, how you embody these voices and give them individuality, right? I mean, that, that in some sense, there is a kind of consistency, it seems to me, um, across books of, you know, a particular milieu of, of, of characters. And yet there's always this really fascinating uh, variation. And I think we saw a, a great example of it tonight with, uh, with, the, with the new stories. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess maybe it's a question of sort of, you know, how you sort of maintain this energy um, in, in the, these characters, the milieu that you're working in. Mm. You know, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I really don't. I, I don't, I mean, how do I maintain the energy? I mean, that's the problem. That's the problem that is there, how finding the energy, finding, creating reality. Um, and it's a terrible challenge. Um, I don't know that I'm always successful. And um, um, so I'm flummoxed here. I'm just struggling. How do I do it? I struggle. I'm struggling and hoping for the best. <laughs> I think that struggle is so, um, so wonderfully apparent in all the stories. Uh, um, and yeah, I mean, I think that that sense of of trying and failing. I mean, I was just sort of noticing it in the in the um, the new story that you read tonight about you know the the very the very last line of that um, story and and um, sort of wondering what am, what am I now? You know, I mean, uh, it's really sort of um, it, you know wonderful evocation. I think of these questions that I mean perhaps we feel particularly intensely right now in the midst of, of, you know, our separations from COVID, et cetera. So, yeah. 
Um, again, I, uh, you know, we're, we, we've reached the end. I am so happy that uh, we were able to, to, to get you to join us. To, oh, to, yes, to I am too. Yeah. So, and thanks to everybody who um, was able to participate. And thanks to Amy and Alan to Lindsay for their, uh, you know, work uh, getting this going. And thank you again so much, Diane. And, um, you know, hope we get to see you again soon, uh, perhaps in person. Oh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Turn it back to Alan here. Yeah, let me just reiterate what Michael said, Diane. It's been just such a delight to have you. It's been a long time coming. I think we're uh, that much better off for having waited. Um, it's been really a great evening. Um, wonderful turnout, wonderful energy from the attendees. Thanks again to Michael for moderating and of course, Amy and Lindsay for participating at the beginning of the conversation. And, and once again, thank you so much, Dan. I'm so glad this worked out and we got you set up in a room where we could all enjoy your company and your reading. Um, and well, it was wonderful. You, the questions were wonderful. You were all so welcoming and warm and, and intelligent. I really appreciate it so much. It was exciting for me. Well, to everyone out there watching, thanks again uh, for joining us at the University of Utah Guest Writer Series. We hope to see you again in the future uh, and have a great night. Cheers, Dan. Thanks again. Bye. Stay well.